restaurants page, you'll be able to choose uh, whatever restaurants you guys like, and you can see the recommended for you, uh, the nearest to you, and all of that. Uh, once you choose the restaurant, this is where the concept becomes really special and new. We don't have any competitors at the moment, so you will be able to choose your number of guests, the time, um, and all of that. And then when you select all the information that you need for your booking, you will be able to choose the exact table in which you want to sit. So basically, we'll have images of the tables of the restaurant because some people have a favorite restaurant to go to. So, of course, they have their favorite table. And people love some spots, you know, maybe there's, a, you know, they take pictures for Instagram and all of that. So, um, of course, I myself, when I imagined it, I imagined it as a user, as a customer. So I thought what's convenient for people. So you'll be able to choose your own table and you'll also be able to view the live status of the restaurant. So from home, you will be able to see exactly how many tables are available at the restaurant. So you, won't, you will not even have to queue or be, be put in a waiting list or anything. So it's 100% safe and it highly improve, improves customer service. So um, I was talking also about uh, contactless menus. So of course, you know, like now they're putting the QR scan codes and all of that. So we put it just as a simple menu because we want the customers to be able to view the menu even before leaving the house. So you have an idea at least of like the price range of uh, what food they serve and all of that. So um, we did that and we also implemented something brand new, which is the contactless order. So I noticed that in I traveled a lot and I've seen in every single restaurant in the entire world uh, the same problem, which is being noticed by the waiters. So there's never enough waiters for each table. OK, so maybe it's like one waiter for four or five tables. And sometimes, you know, you're really hungry or you have something else to do later on. So you just really want to get your food very quickly. So instead of just waiting for the waiter, you just place your order from the phone and it goes to the kitchen and your food is getting ready. And some people are introverts as well, so they don't really want to talk to the waiters, you know. And uh, basically, we will have also an option, which is the pre-order. So you'll be able to order uh, from home before actually going to the restaurant. So when you arrive, your food will be ready for you. So you won't even have to wait for your food, which, for example, happens to me a lot when I'm really hungry and I just want to go to the restaurant and eat directly. I don't want to wait for food to be to get ready and all of that. So we'll implement also a UTC events. So you guys will be able to uh, view all the special promotions, ladies night, anything that uh, that's special and that's not like usual that restaurants yeah. do yeah business lunch and all these things so um we're implementing this because so many you know people are bored sometimes in this country and they don't know what to do and they try to look for something and they can't find it so instead of like them going and looking on websites and all of that they can just go in one app it's a one-stop shop basically so we do everything so when I got the idea, how I got the idea, uh, basically it's from a personal experience. So I thought, uh, why aren't we able to choose uh, exactly where we want to sit? You know, like, in, like on the plane, when you're in an airplane or in a cinema. So you will be able to choose exactly where you want to sit. And uh, this is how uh, the idea came to me. And of course, I experienced like a lot of, I had a lot of challenges, um, which is absolutely normal, especially when it's not your background. Uh, but I had a lot of support from everyone around me and people helped me a lot, uh, my friends, my family and all. So the app is uh, going to be ready hopefully next week and uh, you guys will be able to uh, download it and you can enjoy uh, using it. So that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, it's a really interesting idea. Uh, I really can't wait to to try it out and and actually uh, pre-order before I reach, especially when I have like, you know, uh, a break for lunch in, at work. That's going to be super effective and super useful. Uh, and I can't wait to download your app. Uh, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation and being here. 
and um, I was really sorry for the technical uh, issues again. No worries, that's nothing. At least we, got, we were able to discuss. That's really important. Uh, now we'll have Mohamed Radwan and he will be introducing uh, Fabrik Qatar. Uh, he is the CEO of Fabrik Qatar and uh, we can't wait to hear his story. Hello. Hello, did you Hello. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Perfectly. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share our experience uh, in Fabricat here. So, uh, Fabricat, as you said, stands for Fabri Fabrication Qatar. It's Qatar's, Qatar's first short term production hub. So, um, the team behind Fabricat is uh, eight member KU graduates. Uh, seven of them are mechanical engineers, and one is computer engineer. Uh, and in fact, each one of them has not only like mechanical or engineering background, he also has like some uh, skills that qualifies him to, to run a business on his, on his own. Like um, we have someone who is the expert in photography. We have someone who's expert on marketing, um, a pro a procurement and etc. In fact, the idea came out of, uh, of the need. We are all uh, engineers, so we made a lot of projects during the university period and we were just ending each project at the end of like we have a good product or a good project and we just leave it there because we, we don't see how can we put this into the market? How can we test our product if we really make it commercial product and put it in the market? Will it work or no? The, the only thing we were thinking of is if we put it, we only have only one gate is China gate. It's just send the product to China, tell them to manufacture it and send it back. The problem in that is it will cost a lot of money because usually the quantities they are requiring is, is much higher than uh, the quantity you need to test the market. So from here, we came up with the uh, idea of Fabricat is to have a place where we have machines that capable of doing custom, uh, uh, let's say custom uh, ports. Uh, it doesn't require uh, mass production to work uh, and it's simple and cheap here for the Qatari market. And we found it also uh, doesn't make sense to include all the, um, all the machinery out there in the industry like metal manufacturing. So the second part of the idea was to have um, a, an on online portal where we connect all the um, all the like uh, manufacturers or suppliers of of things that doesn't make sense to have it in house. Uh, I heard Yahya Yahya saying that he started uh, Voltat in a garage. We actually started Fabricat in a much like <laughs> low quality garage but it was the only thing we have there. We did a lot of effort to convert that garage to a place where we can work and start the idea and, and validate our concept. And then we went for GIC, uh, where we got a, a table, just a small table there, where we put our computers and started working there, and uh, uh, we were running all the machinery in the garage. And then we came to the validation process where we got uh, a larger project from uh, Siava, which is owned by Iftikar. Uh, we had a partnership to test our, uh, their, their first batch of manufacturing uh, like uh, lifestyle products. This was total of 200 custom plastic parts and uh, it, it was a really good, a like a good and a challenging uh, project for us to, to work on. And we were able to do it all and, and, and our idea was validated just when we know that if, if we're going to put these products in China, for example, it's going to be like five, six, seven times um, like more expensive than what we did it for. And during the COVID, we, we, cannot, we were not able to work on the garage, so we moved all the machinery in-house. So I had uh, a manufacturing facility in my bedroom. Uh, just to keep things working and, and just to expand our business. And finally, we went for the lean manufacturing pro program by Cubic, and we completed the program uh, the last cycle, and we have been uh, granted a, a manufacturing space there in Cubic to uh, initiate our uh, idea. So we started from a garage and we ended up in a manufacturing uh, facility or we are building a manufacturing facility. This is the place we are building right now or the layout for the place where we are building right, right now. 
And thank you, that's it. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today and thank you all for listening. Thanks a lot for this amazing presentation and this amazing success story. When I first heard about your company, I was really happy with what you've done and uh, the work that you guys that did, uh, especially that I know Ziad and multiple uh, and Hussam. And I'm really glad that uh, this uh, project, like your startup work is working out and it's continue, it's gonna inshallah continue to grow and more and more. And I'm so happy about like, you were just discussing how you had a partnership with a company that is a part of Ibtikar. So that it's, it's a really interesting story and it's a really nice story that's gonna segue, segue nicely into our next uh, part, which is the panel discussion. So I'll just lay out some general rule, uh, our rules. Uh, for, basically, I will ask a question and whenever any of you feel like uh, they're ready to answer the question, you can go ahead and answer it. Uh, I was planning to have multiple like answers per question, but I'm, I'm not sure if we have enough time. So let's see um, uh, what we can do. And uh, uh, I'm really happy that you're all here. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your like discussion and answers on, on these panel questions. So I would say like, uh, a very big question that a lot of our audience here are who are mostly local are are wondering how was your experience with the incubation centers in Qatar because there is a lot of incubation centers in Qatar and especially recently and um, you have uh, you have a lot to go to a lot of choices so the does anyone want to share their story or with incubation centers in general <clears throat> okay, uh, I can start. Sure. So yeah, uh, we uh, we used like uh, we were incubated in DIC first. So and and we are all now incubated on um, on Quebec. So all of all of the incubation centers here in Qatar are doing a great job in developing the ideas and giving you the right uh, instructions to to keep working or keep going from uh, do you hear me yes yes we hear you first yeah uh, uh, and and turn your idea from just an idea to a, an actual startup with uh, all the legal required uh, documents and everything it's all up only about uh, which uh, incubation center is best for your idea? So if your if your idea is based on a digital idea like uh, an application, uh, an automation service on a mobile application or website, it's better for you, for example, to go for DIC because they are, all of their startups are that that kind of, of business model. But if you are requiring, for example, manufacturing as we did, it's better for you to go for Cubic. So that's the thing. I didn't test actually QSTP. Maybe Mohamed Rabia from it's being you uh, may have a really good input on this, but this is my experience basically. <coughs> yeah. So I would talk about the our experience at Qatar Science and Technology Park and uh, in Qatar, as I totally agree with what Mohammed Mith had said uh, about the type of incubation that you want to go through. So in Q Qatar Science and Technology Park and also at QDB, they provide these uh, workshops and programs, accelerator programs that you can, uh, let's say, validate your idea in a way to turn it not only just from a simple idea, but into actual business model and you can have the processes that you know in order to go through with the business. So the support is the support system that that's laid out in Qatar is very uh, unique and different between an incubation center between incubation centers. But the what I would say uh, about Qatar Science and Technology Park is that they provide you the uh, mentorship in addition to a free space for two years. In addition to the unique thing, which is it's a free zone, so you can have your idea there uh, with different legal legislations and rules 
other than that can be applied in in Qatar. So that's something unique about Qatar and Qatar Science and Technology Park. It's a free zone, which is we found out that it's the most suitable to our idea for expansion in the future. Uh, and yeah, but overall the experience for incubations, it's very uh, developed and it's evolving in Qatar. It's it started like three years ago and it started booming all the way up and hopefully we will see more and more startups coming in the future. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your reply and your answer. Uh, well, maybe we, perhaps we can expand this question a bit more and discuss the point that uh, I was just talking to that one about earlier. So how do you uh, like I personally know most of the people right here so I feel like there's a lot of good partnership between like st existing startups in Qatar. So does anyone want to talk about the, the, the startup culture in Qatar and how others support each other? Um, I can maybe uh, talk about uh, our collaboration with Iptika. So basically, as uh, uh, Mr. Naif said, uh, they uh, they create content and they create amazing uh, uh, labs and innovation spaces for students and also for makers in Qatar. Uh, so we always collaborate with them in finding the best uh, like uh, components and equipment to add to these spaces. So, uh, so for us, it's very nice to be able to have a big uh, let's say client or a partnership with uh, with some with someone like Iptikar and for Iptikar also to have good prices with Voltat because we are uh, like Voltat is a small company and they want a, a large margin because they have a, a, a small uh, overhead cost and for us as Voltat we'll, we, we, we will learn a lot from Iptikar because they are ahead of us for example in two or three years so we also learn from them a lot. So this type, and we are also now collaborating with uh, with the Fabricat, we're, we're just starting the process. So this type of collaboration really benefits both sides because we learn from both a lot. And also at the same time, we uh, get some money, <laughs> basically. <laughs> So, so it's, it's very nice to have this type of uh, relationship between the startups and Qatar and especially if uh, if you know someone that already graduated from your patch in Qatar University or from or or from from the same even for this from the same degree like in electrical engineering or 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 in, even in the same college you can find a lot of space of collaboration and this is very nice and this is actually one of the benefits of being incubated in one of the incubation centers like for us for Voltat we have we have like never been incubated in any incubation center because we 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 started uh, we just launched the idea without uh, <coughs> worrying about the legal stuff and whatsoever but uh, i have been like in the multiple uh, like incubation centers i always go there to see what companies uh, that are incubated and try to find a space of collaboration. <clears throat> for my part, um, I was supposed, I didn't mention that, but I went for a Qatar Business Incubation Center. Um, however, I uh, was rejected because my idea was not suiting their uh, requirements or their what, whatever they like. So, um, what I learned from it is that not everyone will validate your idea, but now it's working. So like it's not because yes. they said that it's not going to work, that it's not going to work. I had many people telling me this idea is not going to work and no, 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 no. But now I see that people are very excited about this app and everyone is validating it. And I'm even looking at the bigger picture, you know, I want to expand it to global cities and not just here in Doha because I genuinely think that this is a great idea because I see it as a customer and I also imagined it as a restaurant. So it's suitable for both sides and uh, never listen to someone telling you that it's not um, an, a valid idea because all ideas are good. 
Thanks a lot for that uh, that discussion. It's really important to, to always believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing and believe in your the message of your own company. Um, especially that you're not always going to find like support uh, uh, like because because sometimes like uh, incubation centers or or even like uh, uh, collaborators will always look at at like gain or how they can like get money out of the thing sometimes. So like it's really important to to like push through and do your best. Um, I guess my next question, yeah, the, does anyone want to continue uh, on this topic before I move on to another question? Yeah, yeah I, will, okay. I will also give a small. All right, yeah, go sure. ahead, Max. I would like to add on, on, on the collaboration that's taking place between startups, and I think I think the major difference in uh, these, this new community is being established here in Qatar is really opening a new new opportunities between between those companies. The fact that uh, those startups are hungry into building business and doing things, so it will always run faster, uh, easier, uh, more trustworthy, and helping you to really support your business. So, for example, and I have two two excellent uh, cases between us and between Voltaq by supporting us in the value chain of us providing the service to the clients in the innovation space. And when we tested the of Stiaga, for example, as a new industrial product, as an MVP, just an idea, uh, uh, Fabricat really gave us a huge support to that. Fa, fa what helped us in, okay, those guys are really accessible, fast, uh, easy to deal with, and had to even for me, like يعني, having number of, of network purchasing equipments, and I mentioned that to the to the Vulta team. And you guys were really on on top of our evaluation criteria because you really helped our business in, in a significant way. So, so this is in regarding in uh, supporting the company, supporting each other as startups. And I think this is something is going to grow by by time. On, yes. on the on the first question regarding the the incubation centers, and I think is 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 very important for the entrepreneur or anybody is entering the space. To really be conscious and be aware of all the available players in, 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 in the space and, and to build a connection with them, to understand what do they offer. And it's most important to, to see what is suitable for me. It's not about the quantity of what's, what's being offered, it's about what really suits me as a business, what suits our vision, what suits how, what suits how can we go move forward. So, for example, we've been incubated in Qatar Business Incubation Center for two years, two years and a half, and that was very helpful for our business. Yet we've been there as as their baby. We've been challenged by them to shut down the business. Uh huh. Yeah. So big, and, <laughs> and for a simple reason, and uh, they have a different criteria. They have a different way of looking at things. But I think it, it it relies on the entrepreneur to really challenge that and to make sure. And okay, have we reached an actual fact, and that this will not work out, or it's just an assumption based on somebody who could be perceived as as an expert. Uh, as as simple as that. Thanks a lot for this amazing entry. It was it's really insightful. Uh, now Rabia can uh, share her own view into this. Yeah, so I just wanted to add um, a small uh, also note from my side. Uh, you know, we're also a hardware startup, so we definitely had a very a uh, hard journey in that sense. So really the advice that we got was from all, all the previous hardware startups. So for example, Subul, you know, uh, Saleh is one of, one of the really supportive uh, members of the of the community who really helped us. So shout out to him. And then also uh, Ibtikar and Fab Lab as well. You know, we had a lot of our prototypes there as well. So again, you know, it, it really was through the startup community that we, we got to, you know, even the state that we are now, which is still, you know, we're not there yet, but still wherever we are now is still a big achievement for us as well. So shout out to all the entrepreneurs out there. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and we'd like to add just one small note into this is that the the community and the collaboration is not only between startups. The community itself that we build, that we provide the service for, and not only our as customers or consumers, but also the community. We are elevating like the startup community. If you think about it in a big picture, from the big picture is that you are elevating the community and it's very important to support these small businesses because they 
the success of these businesses means the success of the community. So yes. yeah, that's the note that I have. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this amazing note. It's it's really important to support each other and build each other up, especially when when you start up with, with a small business and a great idea. Uh, and also, like you know, it's always useful to make good partners and good partnership with others, uh, and that play nice. Uh, so I, I guess my next question would be, because uh, like I've heard that multiple of you are like sort of in infiltrating a different business than the ones that they studied. So uh, I'm wondering how does uh, your educational background affect that, and how did it affect? Uh, you, uh, you're like e even like gaining respect from people, and uh, especially that you're just a, like you're just be starting and you don't have a big brand name. So who wants to start this amazing part question? I will jump into this question because I'm not an engineer in any right, and I'm running a hardware engineering <laughs> startup. Um, also, being a, a female CEO as well, all of these put together, <laughs> you know, I have my fair um, share of challenges. But I think the the way that I've been able to, uh, in a way, establish my credibility and so on is because I have my own interest and passion in the idea. So if I'm the one who is on the face of the company and I'm portraying this image of, you know, that this is what I want to do and this is my passion, then I believe that, you know, this is what others also look at it. And secondly, then I have with me a, a team of engineers that can handle the technical side. So these are the two concepts, of course, having confidence in yourself, but then having a strong team to back you up. So this is the only way uh, we've been able to do what we have. That's it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Rabia. So me, I would like to add something. So my background uh, brought a lot of um, advantages because of the way I'm handling the business. I'm not, I have nothing to do with this field, neither business or programming, but uh, some things uh, in aviation, because when you're trained to be a pilot, you're being trained to be a captain. So you must have a leadership. So this is very important in the business as well, to have a proper leadership when you're a CEO. And uh, also we're trained to multitask, you know, when we're on the plane in the cockpit, you have to uh, take care of the navigation, you have to take care of the control tower, you have to talk to many people at the same time, you have to follow procedures. So we're used to multitasking and it's this, exactly the same thing in business. I believe that it's about multitasking and having some leadership. To me, I'm a, I'm, I'm a civil engineer as a background, so I have nothing to do with education and neither I'm, 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 I'm not a techie guy. Yeah, I mean, the technology is the least the least thing that I'm really interested in to honestly speaking for me starting up car. <laughs> and, and, and on a personal level, it was always it was always a fear and it was always intimidating me. I do have a passion toward education because and I personally I'm a strong believer that education could really uplift communities. You see what I mean? Qatar, mashallah, alhamdulillah, there is a lot of resources, but I think there is a huge area for us to really build our technical skills where we can really become a knowledge based economy, a knowledge based society. It's very important. I think we are not the, we are not yet there. So that passion was my main driver to to go through it. Uh, my my business partner Khalid really helped me through this journey to overcome these fears, and and what it took me in, uh, and I still remember when when I joined Ibtikar in 2015, I still I was still doing Ibtikar as a side business for two years until I was convinced that this has to be a full time thing. It's not it's not a part time thing. It will not work out. And I remember from 2015 to 2016, I I, I had to sit down and educate myself. What does a 3D printer mean? How does it work? So where is the difference between brands and and when it comes to educational process, educational experience, what does education experience mean? What does it consist of? Because one of the major challenges that faced us for the first two years in the business and when I go and I present and pitch a car and present any solution, OK, the first question will come to the educators. So what is your background? How long have you been in education? So you've always been challenged by your credibility. Now here can uh, there is this whole background about your technical competency and all of that. And it was it was it was a very rough journey. It was a very rough journey. So and I had to really differentiate being a geek 
and being somebody who really understand how things are working out on, on the intellectual level. You see what I mean? It's a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. So here we're in, uh, by me gaining that confidence and that fitness, differentiating those two, it really helped me to navigate the discussion, to navigate my, my way through it. And I still remember in the early days of, of Abtikar, I, I used to hire like a, a highly technical people with a highly skilled. And, and, and it was a very nasty conversation between me and them. And OK, you have no technical background, so why should you be a CEO of a company without a technical background? And here where you can see the people ego comes in and the geek yeah. ego comes in. You see what I mean? <laughs> but, 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 oh, it, it was it was tough. It was very ugly. It was very nasty. But these moments would really shape my confidence. It's not about me being geek. It's about me understanding what it takes to build something impactful that brings an impact to the community. So, so it's just a matter of if you if you have the willingness to sit down and to really educate yourself, I think you can do it. And I, I mean, mashallah, I think we have we have a good examples here in the panel. I agree. I totally agree. Uh, thanks a lot for this share. It's it's very important to like not lose sight of what you're doing and what is your end goal and and the, the, the end is supporting the local community. It's not all. It's never about just the money or or expansion. It's always about supporting the community and building a healthy relationship with others and and growing. Let, don't get me wrong, money is very important. Sir. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we not be on this panel, yani. it's very important. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. Get, yeah. Money is always the drive, but there, there should always be like some sort of end goal. Don't you agree? Yeah. Because like at some, you, like it's really important to, of course, like expanding and growing, but it's also like important to to have an end goal that you can lead to and and like some sort of like you know feasible end game you know <laughs> yeah so does anyone want to share about this uh, same question before we move on yeah i think i would share um so yeah yes fabricat is kind of production startup but um, I we all like mechanical and engineering uh, from engineering background. But before starting Fabricat, uh, I worked in uh, in civil company, and I worked in uh, event planning company, and I and I'm currently working at Voltaire that most of you don't know. But yeah, I'm working <laughs> at Voltaire as well. So it's is is I worked in in Epticar before as well. So at it has no value to to just limit you at what you studied because um, this will only give you like less than two percent of what actually uh, the market of what you studied but in order to drive a business you need uh, as uh, as nada said um, you you need the skills so basically the skills is what moving you or, or driving you to run a business or to go towards anything so it's it's an advice for anyone want to, well, like wants to 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 do to get into that market or into that field of startups just focus on on skills try to get a lot of skills uh, try to get uh technical or non-technical skills it, it, it will not matter it, it it will just the set of skills you have it that's what will drive your business or drive your personality to into leading the business thank you uh Thanks a lot, uh, Razwan, and thanks a lot, uh, Alia, for for that comment about soft skills. It's really important to to develop them, especially when you get a leadership position uh, in a company or even starting your own startup company. Uh, I, I guess I will move on from the question now. Does anybody have any uh, like departing thoughts about it? Okay, so let's 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 de dig deep into something a bit uh, more technical or more deep. So. Uh, uh, like what I've heard from multiple of you, you that your businesses are either disruptive technologies or disruptive services to the to the like general con like you know like a, a hierarchy of the market. So I would like to hear your insight about this and even like if you have stories about like you know like um, how was your your idea faced especially like in the similar community because you're in the end like disruptive technologies and services are usually frowned upon and like you know hated <laughs> uh, 
who wants to start sharing first? Um, I can start. So okay. thanks for the great question. I think that it's very uh, it's something that's very important for startups is to be by nature disruptive because this being getting into a market that's already they have players there between the theory of the Red Sea and the Blue Sea. You have to really entrepreneurs have to really know how to differentiate themselves and in order to differentiate your startup you have to make something to provide either a unique value that is not been done before and this can not be as in innovation and technology it can be in the supply chain processes it can be in the technology it's itself like the wireless charging here uh, or the collaboration that between the community. So being disruptive, it doesn't mean that you have this artificial intelligence idea that or neural networks, that's part of it, like the technology part, but also it's in the processes of creating the business. It's like building blocks. The building blocks of any startup, it depends on operation services customer support all of this and you can be disruptive in any industry that's what i believe that you can be disruptive in any industry that you get into just you have to really understand the market well so i think it's important for startups to really really understand what is their differentiator between other competitors in addition to the uh, the unique value they are providing. That's it. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks a lot for your answer. Does anyone want to share about this? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll like to, to have like a couple of things. So basically, and I will be a little bit conservative with the disruption as a definition. I think we should focus on how can we add value? Yes. See, regardless if it's a product, if it's a service, I think the fundamental idea and how can we add value to the potential customer, to the potential client, that they are willing to really buy our service or our product. And to be able to, to, to nail that down is, is really having this close uh, interaction, understanding from the customer, from the client on how can we really master this specific uh, uh, value proposition by adding value to them. Because something disrupted, something disrupted, it could, it, it might not add value. It might disrupt things, but it might not add value. But I think our fundamental core focus should be on how can we really add value to 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 our potential customers. Yeah, I completely agree with him. Uh, so, for my part, how I thought about uh, the business, how I thought it was a good idea, I was just targeting the human hassles that people experienced in daily stuff, like daily routine. When you go to a restaurant, there are things that you're annoyed by. So you always have to see how you add values for both sides. So if you're not targeting just one side of, for example, for my part, like for my case, there's like customers and restaurants. So I have to satisfy both. I have to see both hassles and I have to combine these and create something that's suitable for both sides, for everyone, even for me. So, yeah. I will also add just a little bit. So, um, I mean, disruption is one thing, but I think we should also be looking at making impact. So that's something that we have focused on um, with Connect2 as well, you know, really making sure that because the future, you know, we are looking towards sustainable practices as well. So as a startup, of course, you know, you have your, your goals and everything, but I think you should definitely bring in an element of uh, sustainability and, you know, preservation of the environment. And I think what, whatever impact you make there is, is disruptive enough for the world. That's it. <laughs> thanks a lot for your insight and, uh, and thanks a lot for your amazing answers. Uh, it's really important, yes, to to see how your business fits in the, the general community and how you can benefit and at the same time uh, yeah like it's not about disruption it's all about like you know finding your, the right uh, business model and finding uh, like a place in the system 
Um, so I have, uh, um, it's almost time for, uh, for us to go, but so I will have to start taking the Q&A questions from uh, our friends uh, at the IEEE VSYP. Uh, we have a question to Ibtikar. Uh, the question is, is asking if Ibtikar is a, a government institution and um, if it's funding research. And, uh, and if you can talk more with us about your role in incubation centers. So, so, so Aptikar, Aptikar is, 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 is a private company, is a business company. Uh, uh, so this is one thing. Do we fund research and, and that? No, we don't do that. It's not part of our mandate and, and role. Uh, our, our, our role in the incubation center. So basically, since we kicked off the turnkey solution services in the innovation space and education, we've been, we focused on the K-12 as the first segment. Uh, two years later, once we launched our mobile bus that's dedicated for the K-12, that was uh, like a good signal for us and now we can manage bigger spaces. Based on that, we got a request from Qatar Development Bank to, to operate and, and do the setup and operation for the fab lab that's focusing on the entrepreneurs. So we are supporting a QDB, Cubic, a Cubic, uh, Qatar Business Security Center as the operator for the Fab Lab that supports the uh, uh, company's entrepreneurs with the hardware ideas or even building certain technical skills when it comes to hardware prototyping and all of that. So this is in the lab sum what we do. Thanks a lot for your answer. And we have also like a general question that m multiple of you can answer. Also from uh, Rida, uh, from the VSYP um, event. Do you, uh, do you think that there is a business that can be competitive with a similar business in China? So like y you as like startups are like, do you have the chance to compete with with like the Chinese market, especially it, at least locally, if not internationally? Uh, I can answer uh, this question. Uh, I will give an example for the Arduino kit that we sell. So we had before the Arduino kit. Uh, we, we used to sell it, we, we used to import it from China, uh, but we made our own kit actually just to add the value that we see it's missing in the local market and the China people are not addressing. For example, you, you have the Arduino kit that is written in English. We are now developing an Arduino kit with the content that is written in Arabic and we and uh, that can address the market better. So it's not always about making uh, or offering a cheaper option for the community. It's also about adding the value uh, or a specific value for for the market that you're starting with uh, or, or you're starting in. So this is a very important thing to keep in mind. So don't uh, don't always say or don't or don't always think about that. Whatever I do, there is a cheaper option in China, and people I and I won't be able to compete with them. This is not true because people nowadays are not looking only for the price; they are also looking for a value, like the the value that they can find in your product. And if you address it right to the market. Uh, that you are in, you can uh, for sure uh, win over the China product or the China, and with time you can uh, also win over their prices. Does anyone else have uh, insight into this question? Yeah, I think, um, okay, uh, I will not talk in general about China because China is a really large market. It has anything, pretty much anything you can go from uh, really cheap products to the high, highest end products you can ever see. But in general, the products or the, let's talk about the 3D printers market that we find there, or, or any machines kind of low cost machine that you can find it two times cheaper than if you buy it from the US, for example. In fact, what's, what China is selling you is not the engineering, it's not the actual engineering they are selling, they are selling you a manufacturing process. So they are really good at manufacturing, they can do pretty much anything by any price at any time by any quality by any quantity but it's not well engineered as it would be in, in any place so what we are doing here in qatar what uh, for the for the production uh, in, in fabricat for example we put a lot of engineering and efforts 
to to how to make that product fits and how to reduce the efforts, how to make everything make sense as an economical point of view. But if the same process has been done in China, it's going to be uh, mostly relied on the fact that China has a really cheap labor, really cheap machines, uh, a lot of people working in factories overnight for a crazy number of working hours. So it's it, 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 it cannot be compared. But yes, from engineering point of view, you can compete. And from business point of view, as Yahya said, you can compete. Yes. The, does anyone have more uh, more insight into this, especially if, when it comes to customization, right? And and having a certain like you know style. So I would like to just add to uh, these all amazing insights that innovations comes into even if something that's already like as Yahya said and as Muhammad said, even if something that's already available in a market outside Qatar, bringing this type of product or service to the local community with an added value is considered as uh, you can start a business with that. I, I have personally seen a lot of uh, startups that doing a similar thing, but with an added value with customization in terms of uh, the service or the product to making it related to the local community. So innovation comes in multiple ways, and I believe that this is uh, the answer is yes, you can start a business. But you have to add like a tiny bit of value that your local community and the your customers uh, appreciate. I definitely agree with you on this, Rabia. Uh, I personally even worked with uh, Yahya when it came to my senior design project, and we used to order things through Voltat. And a big part of why we ordered through Voltat and not directly was with a, a big part of it was the trust, right? Because we have a very tight schedule and we need to make sure that the things get delivered on time. Sometimes you don't know the sellers that you're you're buying from from online. So it's really important to have someone you trust with you or like even like things like trust or or reliability could be a very big part of your product, right? Um, I think we can conclude in uh, on a on a nice. Uh, Oh, you have an intro. OK, sure. Yeah, I'm going to say ahead. also that like uh, the downside of Chinese products is the trust as well. Like you cannot really trust uh, globally people who are when you see made in China, you kind of, you know, it's like a bit sketchy, you know, so yes. I would trust personally uh, from on my in my opinion, like I would rather trust a product that's made in France or in the United States than a product that comes from China, like that has made in China written on it. Um, especially if it's like a digital, you know, I feel like I will be hacked or something. So that was just my opinion about this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this uh, insight. Um, uh, I would like to also uh, like conclude on this question. So and I think this is a question for all of you. So what is your plan for expansion? Like if we can have like a short yeah, part of uh, of how you if you're if of course first if you are planning to expand out of Qatar and why would you do it or or like or how would you do it just as short as you can do who would like to start first or uh, okay can I start so uh, our idea of uh, the fabricat idea started from a need that the Qatari market has no uh, clear solution for crown production. Uh, if you found that at any place, any other place other than Qatar has the same problem or don't have a, any solution for short-term production, of course we're going to be thinking of how can we get into the market and establish uh, a branch of fabricat there and start uh, going the same way we went in Qatar. But as of now, we see a great potential in Qatar, and we are keeping—I uh, mean, keep going. We will keep going and 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 into expansion in Qatar. 
And once we found that opportunity, as I said, we will be more than happy to go there. Thank you. Hello. So um, yeah, for our part also, we were not um, limited to Qatar from the start. So uh, we already have interest from outside of Qatar and we're working with international companies. So the launch, initial launch is, uh, is going to be outside anyway. So that, that's our expansion oh, plan. And oh. then Qatar is one of the markets. <laughs> Interesting. So you already start, you're, you're launching outside first before you launch on Qatar? Uh, it w we will have uh, in Qatar too, but for example, the manufacturing is definitely outside, so that uh -huh. that country will be the first launch, and then of course it will come to Qatar. Yeah. It's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, who's next? Or uh, for us in Voltat, uh, we were we like the path that we're going uh, uh, to now is to, uh, as I said in my presentation, is to become the next spark fund of the Middle East. So with that, uh, we need to, we, we, we're planning now to start developing our own boards and hopefully with the help of uh, Tikar, we will be able to have a complete solution that we can resell to the whole Middle East, that we have the content in Arabic that can support the education sector and also for people who just want to learn about uh, development board and so on. So by this, we will be uh, will we we will be able to address the not only the Qatar market uh, but also the whole Middle East, hopefully, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, who's next? Or? Uh, to us as a typical, honestly, before the the blockade. Uh, uh, we had three three months of runway and we're mm. planning to shut down uh, but the oh. blockade يعني, came 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 يعني, subhanallah as, as, a, as a bless and it really blocked the regional companies from entering the local market and that gave us a good boost and we can really grow so our main strategy and we really would like to to get the maximum share possible from the local market and whatever we are providing and I think given the fact in uh, education, there is a B2B and there is a B2C still, there is a lot to explore. And, yes. and, and our strategy is to really build our own internal competency, capacity, understanding these differences. And along the side, once the political situation in the GCC gets in a better situation, I think the markets will, 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 will open up again. And this will really help us to, to start navigate and explore where can we go next. Uh, when I don't know, but, but this is our general strategy for now. Is more is mainly focusing on the local market, making sure we get the maximum share for now. So, for yeah. me, you thank you, thanks guys for the input. Like in the expansion plans, there are multiple opinions that were put, like at t tackling the local market first and then expanding to the different markets. And I think that's very, very important for startups. What, wherever, whatever, yeah, wherever the market that you are in, expanding without validating your idea is somehow you have to start validating your idea. So if you don't have customers here, you have to really understand why. It might be you have to pivot your uh, idea a little bit or tweak it a little bit in order to fit to the market and or maybe you think outside so for being you and I would like to add that with COVID-19 uh, situation that happened we were B2C company in providing apparel in apparel like eyewear and operation wise everything was shut down locally and also uh, internationally so we started thinking of providing services B2B and through the technology that we came up with, we started to find that there's really a market here. So what we are, what our plan for expansion is to tackle the apparel industry for the two B2B business and B2C business, which is quite promising to validate your idea in Qatar and also so the thing is you can think globally and think locally as well. So that's our plans.
globally and locally. Yeah, but I really stress out on the point that validating your idea with the current market, understanding the points where you, uh, where you, what's what's happening actually in the market, why this is not a successful uh, business or why it's not going well, it will help you answer, pivot, or tweak your idea to fit the market and become more, let's say, more mature startup. I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for us, we're um, planning to expand, of course. Uh, for now, we started in, in Qatar because that's the base. Uh, but of course, I want to uh, go to other cities, uh, global cities. To st I'm, I will start with Europe because I guess I know the market enough. I've been in many restaurants and I've observed a lot uh, of restaurants in Paris, for example, London and all of the rest of the cities, like even in Czech Republic. Uh, Slovakia, all these countries. So uh, when you study the market, especially if you have an app, you know it's in the air, it's not something physical, so it's very easy to transport it, you know. So the only uh, thing that I'm thinking about is the legal aspect of it. I'm thinking about like establishing a, a company, another company for UTC LLC in Europe, and I have, of course, to study well, like the tax rates there and stuff like that, to be strategic, you know, in order to avoid like a lot of losses. And of course, it might not work here. It might work somewhere else. So it's always important to uh, check globally um, how to see how it works, where it works the best. Yes. Thanks a lot, Talia, for this insight, and thanks a lot, Mohammed. Uh, I'm really happy that I have all of you here, and uh, it was really such an honor to be in this discussion and be a part of this discussion, although I don't have my own startup. <laughs> I, I was uh, really interested in this, and we have way more questions that we cannot cover, unfortunately, because we're running out of time. Um, so I would like to just depart with this message that most of you did, is that you should always believe in your idea, and also like put effort into what you believe in and like of course try not to give up but but work your best to to find where your idea fits the best i think this was a common idea uh, or like common uh, shared experience between all of you so i'm really happy that uh, that you have all uh, were here and that you've um, participated with us and like we, we've all uh, got a lot of experience from you now and we hope that we can have many more of these uh, events where where startups discuss where startups talk to the public uh, so we can foster like mo more and a, a bigger culture for startups in Qatar. Thanks a lot for joining me and for being here um, and um, I'm really happy that uh, you were part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.